सभी को नमस्कार और सब तक है वट एवर दिस इज मी आपका स्वागत है That was yeah. actually pretty good. Was I'm it? Gonna, yeah, I'm gonna give you a seven. Um, because I feel like maybe the only thing you did was you rushed through the words a little bit, just too quickly. Otherwise, like the pronunciation and everything for a white man, pretty good. I'm you know what? Know. You know what it was. It's probably because the 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 lady on Google Translate goes through quite quickly. Yeah, that's true. Um, that true. but it it it's also probably because you know English speakers I find are faster speakers than than Indians as well. Um, yeah, and, I, and and Russian is like mad quick as a language. It is. Russian it it is. Russia. You know, I hope I hope Sartak. I hope you enjoyed that one. <laughs> I'm I'm sure you did. Uh, as you guys can hear, uh, Artem has already introduced the podcast. He basically said, "Welcome uh, to another episode of the whatever this is podcast in Hindi." Uh, this week, of course, I'm joined by him, and we are joined by two very special guests. Uh, first of all, we are joined by someone who's returning. Um, we are joined by. Richard Pike from RFN. Richard, how are you doing? What's up? Good evening, Hanu. Good evening, Archon. All, all, um, all things are good with me. Yep, just actually just finished recording the um, RFN podcast. That'll be out tomorrow. And um, yeah, looking forward to um, appearing back on the podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me back back on again for a second time. Uh, it's our pleasure. And uh, yeah, Richard is Richard is on the run of podcast, so you're going to hear him, of course. Listen to us, and then you can listen to him on RFN. Uh, it's always always fun having him on. Always fun listening to him. And of course, go and listen to the RFN podcast. Um, Great podcast, friends of ours, uh, and the other guest we have is another very very special guest. He's a, he's a debutant. He is, uh, in his own words, Russian football's ambassador to Italy. We have um, the the president of Locomotive Twitter. We have uh, Stefano Stefano Conforti, all the way from Stefano. Where are you right now, and and what's up? Hi uh, everyone. I'm right now on Lake Como. I have a uh, home also in Milan, but right now I'm. Uh, on Lake Como, and that's it. Thank you, Anu and Artyom, for for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here and in the on the best podcast about Russian football. Yes, yes, uh, we're we're, we're we're delighted to have you as well, Stefano. You're you're obviously a massive player on the the football Russian scene, Russian football scene, I should say, on Twitter. And uh, you know, we've been following your tweets for quite a long time, so it's great to have you on. Thank you very much. And as uh, in Italy we say, here we go. I don't say it, but that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, by Fabrizio Romano, which is very popular. I think it's more popular abroad than in Italy because in Italy the king is uh, uh, Gianluca Di Marzio, and uh, he used to work for for Gianluca Fabrizio. Yeah, uh, Stefano is uh, his Twitter is on the screen right now. Uh, give him a follow if you haven't already. Uh, he has more followers than I think all of us combined at this point. Like all three of us in the call right now. So he's give him a follow if you haven't. And his birthday is coming up as well in about eleven days. So that's pretty nice as well. Uh, give his Telegram a follow. I don't know if you give followers on Telegram, but he has a really nice Telegram about Lokomotiv. It's in English, obviously. Uh, his thoughts on you know how Lokomotiv are doing, their match previews, match reports, everything like that. And it's it's really good. You know, give him a, give him a follow. Uh, let's get started. With football, we we have we have some things to discuss. It's uh, last week we discussed nothing about football. This week we're gonna it's gonna be a very heavy football based podcast. And uh, the Russian Premier League. Let's let's start with match day seventeen of the RPL. Uh, Artem, did you watch any games? Do you remember any games? Yeah, do you know what? This, this weekend was actually quite memorable because, as people could see on the screen, three Russian teams scored five goals each. You know, Spartak Zen and Krasnodar had amazing games. You know, locomotive weren't bad either, so um, it it was a really interesting week all around. It really was, and like this day, um, what like this was just after everybody got knocked out of of Europe, so like everybody showed up. We had some mad performances, which we'll get to. Uh, but quickly recap the results: Lokomotiv beat Rubin. We'll come to Stefano about that. Spartak scored five against Tambov, and like these three games were just mad. Like Zenit and Krasnodar were scoring at, at the same time. Ufa got a win against Rostov, which is really big for them. CSK drew two two to Khimki. Uh, Richard, what about you? What games did you watch, and did any stand out to you in particular? Uh, I watched Lokomotiv Rubin. I watched Spartak Tambov. I watched Siska Himki, and I watched. Um, I obviously, I follow. I don't support them in the same way that Stefano supports Lokomotiv, but I I do follow uh, Dinamo's results for RFN. So I watched Dinamo versus Arsenal Tua. They're the four games that I watched this weekend. 
Right. Uh, Stefano, what about you? What games did you watch? Of course, I watched Lokomotiv. Then I watched also the game between Rostov and Ufa, the game between Dinamo and Arsenal, and also more than an hour of Ceska versus Kimki. Right. So let, let's start with um, let's 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 not st- let's start with Lokomotiv Rubin because it is you know the first game that's on there. Um, Stefano, wh- what did you think of this game? Of course, Ignati have had a very good game, but Lokomotiv weren't all the way there. And just for our listeners who might not know, what, what have you thought of Lokomotiv season thus far? How do you think they're doing under Nikolic? How do you think they're doing overall? But which Ignati have had a good game? <laughs> Ours or Ivan? No. Joking. No, Ivan, Ivan is the worst striker in the league. Uh, Ivan Ignati <laughs> is, is terrible. But Vladislav Ignati have really had a really good game. He's 33 and he played like he's 23. So, fair yeah, enough. Yeah, honestly speaking, uh, Lokomotiv played an average game because um, we won mainly thanks to the mistakes made either by the the wrong native, let's say that, and uh, Medvedev because um, in general no one provided a solid performance and uh, in the end if there, uh, there were the spot of each and Dupin, uh, Rubin could have uh, won the game without problems. So the the red card to Ignati have changed the game, and of course with one uh, with one man less, uh, Rubin had uh, huge problems and difficulties to to change the game. So we took advantage of their big points, and that's it. I mean, with one uh, with one man more, you are supposed to win, and uh, we were lucky. But I don't say that. I, I don't want to say that. Uh, Lokomotiv had a very good game and uh, deserved to win. I Stefano, mean, can I can I ask you something? Yeah. When when Ruben scored that goal in the first few minutes, what did you think about? Like, do you think that Guilherme could have done better in that moment, or do you think that just the spin on the ball just put him off and it would have done with most keepers? Well, I think that maybe Guilherme made a mistake, but honestly speaking. Uh, when teams like Rubin play away against us and they score so early, I just think and feel that we are back to five or six years ago when we had huge problems both in the management and with head coaches because with Xiumin it was very hard for the other teams to come to Cherkizovo and to score in the first five minutes. So I think that it's more a problem for the mentality and for the fact that players are not that motivated. And they play very well in the Champions League, of course, because the Champions League is something else and they need also to sell themselves maybe to our European teams if they watch uh, our games. But in the league, uh, Lokomotiv have always had problems with the mentality. So, That's uh, it. It's interesting that you say that, actually, because... The the way the players that Locomotive have brought in have been players this this season like Kamano players who have played in what you would probably consider better leagues than the Russian league. Do you think that they lose that hunger a little bit for wanting to win in, in the Russian league? Would you prefer to get more players like you know Lisakovic and, and those kind of players who are, who are hungry to to play for Locomotive and win in the in the RPL and not just the Champions League? Absolutely yes, I totally agree with you and. Regarding Kamano, I think that he chose Lokomotiv more for money and also Champions League football. But uh, I spoke with several Bordeaux fans uh, and they complained a lot about him. Uh, and uh, if none of the European clubs, like I don't know, Sevilla or uh, Liverpool, which were linked to him, didn't decide to sign him in the end, uh, it's a huge signal because maybe. Either is something who will never turn into a top player, or something that someone that will make the difference. Because he had really just one good season, one and a half good season in France, and everyone is able to to have one or also two seasons good. But you are a good player or a very good player if you, if you can keep the level for at least more than five years. So probably that's that. Yeah, and that is that is true. I prefer a player like Lisakovic, which, like our Nikolic says, is a bandit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He wants to 
to play for us and of course it comes from Shakhtyor Soligorsk uh, which is uh, I mean maybe a big club in Belarus but uh, yeah. compared to Lokomotiv is is very very small so of course he wants to prove himself so I, I prefer some someone like him which also costs less I mean I would yeah. never pay six million for Kamano and Lisa Kovic for one million okay is a bet if it works, it's okay. If it doesn't work, it's always okay. But uh, yeah, that's true. Really just justice for Jaloliddinov as well. He came from Uzbekistan and he's barely played a game. I feel like he would be nice. He can't be worse than a few of the other players you have. But um, that's true. Actually, I think I think Lokomotiv. To I mean, your squad isn't great, honestly. But I feel like Nikol Nikolic has done a really good job. We'll get to him in the uh, minute as well when we talk about the Champions League. Uh, but guys, did you know that Kamano actually has more goals against Russian clubs while he was at Bordeaux than he has in Russia? <laughs> because, he, because he scored against Zenit in, uh, while he was at Bordeaux. And since coming to Loco, he, he doesn't have a single goal, a single assist. So that's, that's a bit mad, honestly. Um, he's been a, real, been a real disappointment, hasn't he? It, it's, yeah, he's been, shit, it's crazy how it's not worked out. I was really looking forward to seeing him play in, in the RPL. But... Honestly, yeah. I mean, even like... Surely you get like an assist. Yes, just... in the, even not not ni- neither an assist or an, a goal. I mean, yeah, it's exactly. A shame. Like even even Gaich has one goal and one assist. Uh, <laughs> even if it, <laughs> even it's a, a, a really simple one, right? And I don't know how. And Gaich has, hasn't played that much while Kamano just starts. Uh, moving on to Z- Artem, you are the Zenit fan. We are the Zenit fans, so we'll come to that in a second. But let, let's get to uh, Spartak in a second. Um, Right, you know what? I'm gonna. I'm not gonna talk about the game, but I'm gonna ask Richard. I'm gonna start with you, but I'm gonna ask this question to everybody. Richard, who do you who do you think is the better strike partnership between Pons and Larson and Zuba and Asmoon? <laughs> Put me on the spot. <laughs> um, do you know what? last season? I well, yeah, last season I thought it was obviously by quite a distance I thought it was Zuba and Asmoon but you know what I think Ponsu and Larson are ca- catching up I mean I still think it is Zuba and Asmoon but Ponsu and Larson okay take into consideration they're playing Tamboff they're not the best opponents around but you know and that that is an understatement but you know I thought they had a, a superb game they linked really really well um, with each other they have been doing in past games also so I'd still say it's Zuba and um and as Moon, but uh, Ponce and Larson are catching up, and um, I really just can't wait for that game, isn't it? In what just under a week's time between yeah, Spurs just, and Zenit, that's going to be fireworks. We'll have a, a big episode because it's going to be what two weeks of RPL, so that's going to be like the last episode before the winter break. That's going to be mad. Uh, yeah. Adam, <laughs> what, what do you think of this question? And I, I'll say mine. I think right now, I think Zuber and um, Asmoon are better because their numbers are just insane. I think they have like 27 goal contributions. I think 17 goals and 10 assists. But uh, Zuber and Asmoon aren't as good in, in Europe and it will depend if, if Larson and Pons can do, if they even stay at Spartak. If they can do better in Europe, then I'll go with them. But for now, it's still Zuber and Asmoon. Artem, what do you think? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you there. I think it is still Zuber and Asmoon. And to be honest, like, if if you just take Asmoon, like if just over the last week, he himself is better than the two of them in the last game week. Like he he had directly a hand in all five in goals. In all five of the goals. Yeah, that's true. That's insane. Like that is insane, honestly. <laughs> I feel like I feel like he should move on now. I think he needs to I think someone should come for him. Because he's he'll fit into a team easily, like easier as compared to Zuba. Because Zuba, you know, he's I don't I don't think so. You know, and so. it's it's not to do with the style of play. I think Asmund can play in a lot of different um, you know, formations and he's probably a bit more versatile in that sense than Zuba is, but I just I think that Asmund isn't the most look, people might criticize me for this, but I don't think he's the most mentally strong player. Like he doesn't take criticism the best, and I feel like if he didn't get on the right foot at a new club, it could all go downhill from. I think he's fairly comfortable at Zenit. He he enjoys being there, and I, I I just can't imagine that, like, I he definitely wouldn't leave Zenit to play for like a Premier League club that's not in the Champions League or in Europe. Yeah, definitely not. But how many how many clubs above that level are going to come in from? You know what I mean? So that that's why yeah. I just I I don't see him leaving. Honestly, I'm fine with that. 
I feel like if I mean you know he he did go a year without a goal at Ruben that did happen uh, like almost like what three fifty six days or something like that without a goal so he has that was almost two years ago at this point but still it is it is worrying just having that on you uh, but Zanit absolutely demolished Ural uh, the last time they played at home they won seven one this time they won five one uh, Azmoun three goals uh, won a penalty assisted another goal and Douglas Santos Artem by the way what a player. He's, Oi, I'm a massive fan. He is him. unbelievable. He is massive just fan. he's so underrated. He scores goals. He creates everything from left back. He's just six and a half million for him was a great bit of business. Uh, but Stefano, what do you think of our question? Who do you think is better between Zuba and Zmoon and uh, Pons, Pons and Larson? Well, I think that on paper Zuba and Zmoon are better, but probably at the moment I would go for Ponce and Larson because they are very in form. And something that I was thinking when Artyom was speaking is that I agree that Asmoon is a very, very good striker, but uh, if we analyze Zenit in the last three years, uh, and especially in Europe, I mean, um, they didn't make a difference that, that much. So due to the limits on foreign players, uh, probably you have to make decisions and probably um, as Moon and also Drews, which are the third striker, probably I will, I will sell them and go for some, someone else. Because uh, if, you, if you score an at trick in the Russian league, it's, uh, it's good, it's okay. I mean, you're good. But... Uh, is in Europe that you, you really have to, to prove yourself. And I feel that Zuba and Asmoon, especially in the last year, they they failed. So probably they need, need uh, something else, probably. And all... Probably That's true. Cool. Yeah. He's probably the most underrated player in the league because he can play almost everywhere in the in the field, uh, center back, uh, left back uh, in, as a midfielder, midfielder as a exactly, as, yeah. as, as a winger and uh, he keeps the same level and and the same performance in every position and it makes it very 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 strong. And when I was watching a game of Zenit, I don't remember who was commenting the game, but uh, he told that uh, Douglas was second in the list of uh, of wish for Zenit in that position, the first was uh, Renan Lodi. The yeah, he went back. to Atletico. Uh-huh. And uh, luckily, I think, I would like to say that in the end, they, they choose Douglas because, yeah, Renan is, is very good, but Douglas uh, lets you do such an universalism that uh, it's very important. Yeah, there's slightly different types of players as well, and I think he suits, Douglas suits Zenit really well. Uh, but just to quickly get off the RPL, Krasnodar smashed uh, Rotor Ari got his first goals in like since March or something. Uh, Victor Clayson scored a brace. Shapi got a goal. Shapi somehow has played 100 games already for Krasnodar, uh, which is slightly mad. To That's insane. Like, yeah, how, can, how can you be 20 uh, and play 100 games in professional football already? That's mad. Uh, Rostov lost to Ufa. Um, Richard, did you discuss Karpin on the RFN podcast? <laughs> no, no, we didn't touch on Carpin. We touched on Ufa though, and um, quite impressive how they've um, got two wins, back to back wins. No, I mean we re- we were really fearful for them. Um, yeah, they were yeah. really struggling. You know, the, the departure of Gaziz off in the summer, I think, really flattened them. But um, you know, to get two good be. wins under the belt, the you know, I think yeah. now, yeah, it's um, hopefully turning round for them, and it puts Tamboff in the relegation zone, which is very nice. So that is very nice. That is true. <laughs> and Ufa, Ufa, like two just a week ago, we were really afraid. I thought they were not going to get out, but they're already up to 14th. And Artem, you know what? This makes me scared about our bet as well. Because on our bet, I feel like you might be getting back into it. Of course, I'm getting back into it. We knew this. Like, the, uh, there's no, only you, five you, points in it now. You were, you, know, you, to, you were you were ready to pay me last week, and now you're saying there's only five points in it. Look, you know, exaggerated emotions in the heat of the moment and all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. But like, I, 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 honestly, I think that your shout of Ahmad getting into Europe is sounding more ridiculous by the day. Ahmad are ahead of Krasnodar, so <laughs> yeah, for, yeah, but they were way ahead of them a couple of weeks ago. It's fine. Every every team has a rough patch. It's fine. Um, 
this final game, Artem, your your prediction about uh, or your joke about Kimki being the Russian AC Milan actually turned out to be real. Uh, <laughs> they've they've won they've won like four out of their past five games. They're unbeaten in like a month. They've they got points of like a, a ton of huge clubs. By the way, guys, we are recording as the CSK Dinamo Zagreb game is going on. It's a dead rubber game. No one really cares about it, but we will uh, give you some of some updates on it. So stay tuned for that. But that's it for the RPL. Some big games this Alec, week. Obviously. Can we just mention that? What? Clearly, whoever runs the the RPL Google page listens to this podcast because for a couple All of the weeks clubs now, have logos. exactly for a couple of weeks now we've been clowning on the fact that Himki didn't have the right logo. Tampo <laughs> had their own logo, and you know, like a couple of weeks later. All of a sudden, all the clubs have the right logos. That's not a coincidence. That's not a coincidence. Uh, but some big, big games in the RPL. Zenit, Dinamo, Krasnodar, Lokomotiv, Akhmat, Rostov. Some good games. And then, yeah, some really good games for us to cover. Yeah, and uh, n- next week is midweek as well. That they're the last game. That's crazy. The... You know why this is mad? Because our pod will like be right after the week is over. I mean, Maybe no one, Tomba would all, no one cares, but like... <laughs> I, I, I think we're going to have to wait until the whole game week's over to record it, to be honest. No, we're not. Turn off for a while. Just last yeah. game before the winter break. Good God. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And watch, like, it, watch it before four. <laughs> I don't think Tambo have ever scored four in their lives. So I don't think that's going to happen. Um, speaking of the winter break, the winter break has started in the FNL. I just remembered that. So I'll just put it out there. Uh, now, this is this is interesting, Artem. This is interesting, right? And because this will get us directly into our Champions League topic, um, Sebastian Driussi went on Twitch one night. This was about two or three days ago at this point. And he said, uh, I've been playing in this stupid position for the last three years. I miss River Plate and playing as a striker. I'm ready to come back at any moment. And it it caused uproar. Uh, people were mad. Some people were mad at Driussi. Some people were supporting Driussi. Because, well, he is, he is a striker by nature. And he's been playing out on the wing for a while now, for three years, like he says. But Artem, uh, and apparently he's just going to get a fine. He's not going to leave the club or anything, which I thought originally would happen. Uh, Artem, what do you think of his comments? And do you think he's better up front or as a winger? You know, like, I don't have any problem with those kind of comments because I don't think that this is the first time he's brought this up. Like, I feel like he would have said it to teammates or the coach or someone. Like... I really don't think that this is something that he's been thinking about, hasn't said to anybody. Like, we knew for a long time that Jersey wanted to play up front. We did know that. And, like, he, clearly his frustration, like, leapt out at that, that one night when he was streaming. And, honestly, I don't have any problem with it. Like, fair enough. We, we all get in these moods sometimes. And when you're not playing at the position you want for the last two years, like... It's it's completely understandable to be frustrated about that. So I don't have any problem with it, especially since like you know Semak played him up front in the Champions League, and he completely backed up his point that like, look, I can play here. He scored he scored the only goal for Zenit that night. So um, nothing but respect for him, and I, I hope he stays. Um, to to answer your question, whether he's better on the wing or up front, I don't really know. Like I don't think he's he's an out and out striker, but playing just behind the striker, he could be really good. Um, what I've always liked about Jersey is that he works really hard, um, and you know he's a bit cheeky sometimes on the pitch, which I, which I like too. So um, I do, I do hope he stays. And uh, I thought I thought it was also funny that um, Richard Stefano, you might not know this, but um, Hanu tweeted out that like Jersey's contract is expiring at the end of the season. That's off the record. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I'm, I swear, that you're gonna have to cut it out otherwise. DUC's contract expires in uh, 2022, and an official allegedly. Source called, okay, and fine. Al- allegedly. No. Yeah, and allegedly, an official source who may or may not be at a very high level at Zenit messaged the RFN account and told us that. Uh, now you guys can guess who that is and, and have fun with that. Um, moving swiftly on, because I want to, because I don't want to get hit with another DM. Champions League football. Champions League is over. Guys, um, and let's let's stick to Zenit. Let's stick to Zenit. Now, this game made me sad, right? I, I had spoken to Artem, I had spoken to a few other people, and uh, we were in agreement that we would not be surprised at all if Zenit won this game. Um, and they almost did. For 65 minutes, they played some amazing football. They were just free-flowing, managed to take the lead. Ryuzi scored a really nice goal. Malcolm was good. 
there were no real bad performances but again as we see with russian football time and again you just let yourself down pace check this is a proper fifa goal equalized it just a scrap in the box made it 1-1 and then axel witsel was just given way too much space and time outside of the box and he curled a shot in into kozakov's near corner uh richard what are your thoughts on the game and did you did you really care for it or were you just oh, yeah. a- I did watch it, um, Hannah. I did watch it. Yeah, um, it was. It's one of those games where you know I thought this did represent a chance for Zenit because when I saw the day before about Dortmund and they had a number of absentees, most notably Erling Haaland, who you know was out to the new year, I think. So I thought, you know, I'll, I'll give this game a watch. You know, I'm working from home now, so that that's helpful when watching the six pm UK time kickoffs. Um, and you know, for Zenit made a decent start to the game, they got ahead via Drusi, and I thought, you know, they were playing quite well in the first half. And then again, in that second half, it, it, it's, it was almost a micro, it was almost, um, you know, a reverse of the first game against Bruges. I thought in the first half against Bruges at home in the, in the first match day, they were too conservative, and then they suddenly started, you know waking up in the second half, pushing forward a bit more, doing what they should have done, getting on the front foot, doing what they should have done in the first half. And this was kind of the opposite. They did really well at the start in the first half of this game. And then second half, I felt they really could have gone when they were 1-0 up for a, a goal, a second goal a bit earlier, you know, just to, then that could have really put Dortmund under pressure and they could have got the win. But but what's frustrating again about Zanit is individual mistakes cost them this. You know, it's, um, I mean, yeah, OK, you could argue... Samat so probably and Zenit probably should have pushed up furthermore in the second half, got that second goal, but to try and you know hopefully kill the game. But oh, individual mistakes again, like Kurtzakov not holding that ball, just pushing it out to Pishek who um, who slotted home. And then I know you know I know it was a, a hero's return and a hero's welcome back to Axel Witzel, you know. But um, you don't want to admire him that much, um, Zenit defenders and midfielders. There were six of them, and they didn't close him down. It's it was just unbelievable. You know, I know he's been a great he was a great player for Zenit and deserves respect, but not that much respect, guys. You know, you've got to get to him. You've got to close him down. He was just given far too much room for that shot, and it just obviously it beat Kurt Sakoff at the post. It, it, it squeezed, you know, just just missed the hit in the post and just beat Kurt Sakoff at you know low down and. Yeah, it's frustrating. I think it kind of just that game just summed up Zenit's Champions League campaign. Just you know, never got going right from the word go, and a big disappointment. I mean, really, really big disappointment because uh, you know you really thought when that group was drawn, okay, Dortmund, you probably you know you leave them out of this, but I think battling with Lu- with Lazio and Bruges for second place was a possibility, even though. You know, there are things that hinder Russian clubs like foreign limit and injuries and COVID. You know, Zenit didn't really suffer as much injuries and COVID as the likes of Lokomotiv and Krasnodar. You know, the foreign limit's an issue. But, you know, you still thought Zenit, after last season's battle and display in Europe, you thought they could have got battled for second place. You know, I did think that was realistic. But yeah, just very, very disappointing. Definitely was. And, I, I mean, they finished with one point, uh, which is, I think, the worst performance ever by a bot one team in the Champions League. Only two other clubs got one point. One of them was a debutant. The other one was playing their first campaign in like 25 years. Uh, so, Stefano, why do you think Zenit are... Why do you think they were so bad this season? Do you think it's because the squad is bad? Do you think it's because the manager is bad? Do you think because of individual errors? What do you think was the reason? I think that probably they need new blood. New blood. And whether is the coach or whether is the lineup, that's a fact. Same yeah, that's pro- true. Pro- provided to be a, a good coach, but in the European arena, um, he hasn't lived up to expectations. So probably um, I would consider to, to, to another coach because the team, of course, has some weak points, but uh, I think that is enough to beat uh, Club Bruges and uh, to qualify at least for the Europa League. Then, of course, against Dortmund and Lazio, it's uh, something else, but what has disappointed me more is the fact that um, Zenit have played very, very, very disappointing in all the five games because against Dortmund in the last one they were actually good, but it doesn't surprise me because they didn't have nothing to lose and uh, it's like that. I mean, Russian people, I think that uh, 
they have such an attitude because I've been following uh, Russian football for almost 10 years and uh, I've seen a lot of games like Zenit against Dortmund and uh, I mean you, you don't have to start working uh, just when your boss comes inside and, and watch at your PC but you have to work uh, every game and every minute I mean I like that analogy yeah because yeah. It, it seems that Zenit in the last game of the group when they can do anything or oh, really so let's get let's let's play some good football and it doesn't work like that you don't achieve anything if you you have such an attitude yeah i think you're 100% right i i said this to hanu as well last week that like it doesn't look it never looked throughout this group stage that zenit would ever get through like there was no game where i we watched maybe Maybe this Dortmund game, but like we we're already out at that point. Yeah, there was no game where you watched Zenit and thought, "Oh my god, like this is some really good football. We could really win this game. Like we're in control." It's always, "Oh no, oh no, oh no." <laughs> <laughs> Sums it up perfectly. Yeah, it so really was, it, and I think they need a big window. It really, they, really. they they absolutely need a big window, and um, it'll be interesting to see who who they target. Obviously. You know, a couple of foreigners may may have to leave. Um, I really want us to. I, I want to see us get a goalkeeper. It's one of the things I want to see. Um, but I, I I don't know what else. Like I don't know if the manager has to change. I don't know what what else has to change. Um, Semek should go on some kind of co- coaching courses or like play FM with Zenit and just try loads of stuff out or something. Oof. I don't know. Well, I don't know. Does he though? Because every single Zenit game was lost because of individual error and players being idiotic. I'm not sure that's true. I think I think for to, to an extent, yeah, individual errors do that. But like the tactics lend themselves to opening these errors. Like that, like I feel like <sighs> we we talked about this like so a lot of times before, where like Semak has like one tactic, and it doesn't matter who you're playing. If you're playing Oral or Rotter or you're playing Borussia Dortmund, it's the same tactic. And it's like, I mean, like yeah, you have to be a little bit adaptable. Like yeah. You, I- that's true. I mean, I guess so. Yeah. I I guess so. But I mean, I felt like Zenit was really good against Dortmund. Like the tactics were different. They weren't like Malcolm and and the wingers were actually playing like wingers and not just trying to support Zuba. So, oh, but, yeah, but Zuba, it's but because like, Zuba wasn't playing. That's the that's yeah, the only difference in this tactic. I, I, I was thinking the same because Zenit is Zuba centric. I mean, yeah. if you, if if you manage to stop Zuba, you almost uh, stop more than half of the potential of Zenit. And Semak has just one tactic. Exactly. Give the, give the ball. Yeah, I mean, he Cuba did well for 65 minutes. Really. Make an if, it, or a goal. if it wasn't for stupid goalkeeping from Kazakov, and if it wasn't for like, there's nothing he can do about that because they played really, really well for however much. I don't know. I mean, he's not the greatest tactically. We know that, but I feel like this Champions League campaign was. He's not lost. great tactically. Is a bit of an understatement, like. No, I, 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 I think I think there's so many things you can do with that Zenit team. Like there's so many different, like half of the players in that team can play at about five positions. Like there's that's so a, many different things you know, that you could try. That, out. That's that's also another thing which I wonder a lot is if you remember yeah. like the first one and a half season of Semak, he tried a load of different stuff. He played like three at the back formations, played five at the back, played like four three three. He did a lot of stuff and he just stopped tinkering since it's just always four four two with Kuziyev playing as left wing, which is very annoying. And it's just things like that. So I don't know. So, I feel like. Do you know what, guys? I think that's a good point because I thought when he signed Vendel, I thought he was going to go to a four-three-one-two, and probably you know you can keep your Zuba and Asmoon up front, but also maybe have Malcolm in a completely free role behind, and then free in midfield. You know, with Vendel pushing forward, add a little bit of creativity, possibly some goals. You know, yeah. I think I think I definitely think our Tom has a point. I think. The problem with Semak is he he does tend to just stick and Stefano, and Stefano too. I think he does tend to stick to just one formation. I think that has badly let him down in Europe and sometimes game management a bit questionable as well. You know when he was one nil up against Lazio in was it game day three? Now Lazio had been suffering from injuries and COVID then, and I felt that you know would it have been a good idea when Lazio brought on Cataldi and Pereira? I think Semak should have reacted then. He should have brought on Vendel. He was far far too late in bringing Vendel and- on. Yeah. You know, that's a good thing you mentioned. His substitutes are so weird. Zenit was chasing the game and he brought... I mean, that's a really good point to be heard. He brought on Krugovoy and Karavayev in the 80th minute. When there's Mostovoy on the bench, there's Zherkov who can still play on the bench. 
there's Shamkin yeah, who he... I guess is better than Karavaya if you want to Mostovoy obviously is there and I mean I don't know I feel like Zenit a lot 50% of it was lost due to just how bad the players were in, in small situations and 50% maybe the tactics but do you, Artem do, do you think that maybe during the winter break Samak needs to think about like Zuba's role in the team like we talked about it there, Stefano mentioned that once you like cut Zuba out of the game, you pretty much cut Zenit out of the game. Do you think that maybe like given his form, the 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 Zenit team should focus more on being as moon centric? Because he can do a lot of different things. Like he's good in the air, he scored a header there the other day. You know, he's a good I mean, finisher, he can make runs in behind defenders. Like there's a lot of different ways you can play with him on the pitch and it's like Okay, they can cut out one way, but he still has a lot in his arsenal that can, you know, that can I think, change I mean, the game. I yeah, feel that's like a good point. That's a good. I feel like I think Zuba is still a very good player, and his form says that his his record and his his output is still mad, even if it is like penalties and stuff. It's it's still pretty good. But I feel like as he gets older, you have to reach a point where you start considering that you start considering some of the things that. You, you should, he should re- reduce his dependency on Zuba, I think. That's for sure. Like, he should have two or three yeah. proper systems. Don't cut Zuba out, but don't rely on him to be your main man all the time and just be completely toothless without him. Exactly. So, and it, it, to be honest, it could work that way where, you know, like, sometimes Zuba is, like, you know, Zuba's huge. Like, he's so difficult to mark. So, like, sometimes you'd need two players to mark. And if two players are marking him, that means there's another player free somewhere else. And it's like, in that way, I think Zuba can be like really, really useful. But that's not the way that Semex is using him right now. Semex is using him as a lone striker mainly, and trying to get just balls, just thrown into him in the box. Yeah, he's, like, he's useless as a lone striker, honestly. Though that's the thing. Yeah. It's it, it should. It With Asmoon, like he's insane. With Asmoon, they them two are mad. But exactly, it's pretty bad. By the way, Artem is Sutorman the best right back in the league. Um, you know. We like to jump the gun on this podcast quite a lot, so um, he he has been named the the Russian Cafu. So, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> no, but I'm I'm honestly telling you, who is Zenit's backup right back? They don't have one, do they? No, they don't have a backup right back. The, so Dorman can compete for the starting spot. He's been that good over the past however many games he's played at right back. Yeah, he's, I mean, he, the, I'll, the, tell the, what, the, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, Hanu, I'll tell you what, Hanu. Um, he could uh, take inspiration from Lucas Vasquez, who's been brilliant. He is Lucas Vasquez. Great. Yeah, he is Lucas. Because Lucas Vasquez, they're very similar. Because Lucas Vasquez gets memed a lot at Real Madrid. Yes. He gets memed a lot because he, you know, he's people just say he's not a Real Madrid standard player, and that's true because he he does act like a bit of a, a dumb player at times. But in the big games, and he always he's he's a very reliable player and a player who always wants to play. He gives us hundred percent. No one can dispute that. No. So Sutorman no. so Sutorman has done the same thing. He's like Vasquez isn't useful up front. We have five players better than him. Maybe but six. He, Hanu, here's the question for you, and here's the question to everyone: Has Sutorman really justified his transfer fee? <laughs> it was worth all two euros. He has, I think. So, hey, yeah. hey, he he costs almost as much as a, a used iPhone ten. He has. <laughs> I mean, much better value than Kamano for sure, or Bruno Fuchs, by the way, who still exists. Bruno Fuchs exists. He's a <laughs> Eight and a eight and a half million for twelve minutes of football. He's, uh, he, you know, he's better value than Wendell as well. You know, we we have to hit it close to home as well. Like Kumar has not been doing too well. Kumar, <laughs> yeah. I mean, he was good honestly against Dortmund for like the five minutes he played. But like, I mean, what can you say? But no, I, I really do think Sutorman has a future at right back. He should stay there. He's far more useful as right back than he is up front. He can. His crosses are great. His assists are pretty good. Yeah, uh, I agree with that because at the end of the day, Zenit have quite a lot of wingers, don't they? They have, you know, Malcolm who can play yeah. on the wing. They've got, at the minute, Drews who can play on the wing. They've got Mostovoy can play. Yeah, I think his future probably lies on uh, at right back if he's going to have any future there. Although, I mean, it's quite interesting. We were discussing on the RFM pod about Juicy probably being the foreigner who Zenit probably could view as most expendable right now because, you know, they've spent a lot of money on Malcolm. They're probably not going to want to give up on him, you know, so soon. Uh, maybe even you know Rakitsky's really struggled this season. Actually, I think. I mean, I I'm beginning to wonder whether you know Mamama might still have a future at Zenit if he can carry on playing for Sochi and keeping getting himself back into shape after all his injuries. So that could be one to watch. Maybe yeah, 
that could be it'll be interesting to see how zen it cope in the winter and so on speaking of center backs though quickly um there there was a new um a new article went up on sports express about like 10 minutes ago or something like that about okay. you 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 probably yeah you've you've probably heard about that that center back Waldemar Anton who plays in in Germany okay. and in 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 this interview he says that he he wants to play in Russia so you know a lot of russian clubs could be looking for a new center back you know he might be coming to the league soon i hope Spartak, so. Spartak possibly i think no is it i feel like he should come i should come to anyone i love to see players with russian second citizenship come and play in the league i did a whole fm save on that it went very well for the first 15 games and after that it fell apart but that's fine <laughs> but there's lots of potential over there even for goalkeepers artem there's a couple of good azerbaijani goalkeepers at karabag that zenit should look to sign with russian second citizenship so keep keep an eye out for um, that there as well. people from our, our, uh, is it Azeris? Is that what you call them? Yeah, a- yeah. Azerbaijanis. Az- Az- Azeris. Yeah. Are they ex- they're not they no, count as they count, right? they count as foreigners, yeah. Yeah. That's what I don't it's, like. The, the, the limit should just made should be made for all former Soviet nations. Yeah, or they should do something like bordering nations because that'd be really cool you know a few North Koreans Mongolians North Koreans exactly a, po- um, a few po- you know, like Polish people even that would be mad Polish footballers being exempt from the limit would be a bit crazy but uh, moving on Stefano has been a bit quiet let's get him back into the game yeah. Bayern Lokomotiv uh, I was watching the Real Madrid game because it was we were almost getting knocked out of the Champions League but we pulled through. It was a very easy game, thankfully. Top of the group somehow. Uh, at the same time, Bayern were playing Loco. Bayern put out a really rotated 11. And Loco had nobody on the bench. This is the okay. worst bench I've seen for any Champions League club. And Adair started, Kamano started. Uh, Stefano, take us, take us through this game. How did you feel? Uh, are you upset at the result or did you expect it so you're not that sad? I will be very short because the game was as expected. I mean... Bayern had some second lines, and uh, while well, uh, Lokomotiv had almost no ones which <laughs> we, we, we can have made the difference. So we parked the bus and uh, we tried to to use the counter attacks. But uh, in the end, if you watch the game, uh, neither there or Kamano or Ribczynski or Antro Miranchuk was uh, accurate. So in the most lucky scenario we we arrived to the, to the Neuer area but uh, there we didn't manage to create anything dangerous and uh, Guilherme was good the defense was more or less good but uh, Bayern didn't play not even at the 20 percent potential so that's that's I mean fair that's um, not much to say I mean I, I'm happy for those players who came from the bench, so Josifov and uh, Siljanov, who made the, the debut in the Champions League, which is very important for a young player, I think. And also, Magkiev made uh, a good game, but, uh, I mean... The yeah, game and, and what did you think of, because, I mean, all of us really thought that Lokomotiv, I for sure would thought that, uh, you know, when the groups were done, I thought Lokomotiv were going to finish with zero wins, zero draws. Six losses, going to score three goals and concede like 25. But they did very well. They played really well, in my opinion. Uh, Nikolic is, I know he's controversial in the Lokomotiv fan groups, and maybe you can tell us more about that. But I think he's a very good manager. The things he's done with your squad are impressive. I hope the board backs him. Uh, But what do you think of your campaign? What do you think of Nikolic? Objectively speaking, I think that Nikolic made a good job but uh, the way he decided to play against Salzburg in Moscow is uh, is yeah. unfair and it's unacceptable. I mean, uh, playing with three defenders in the most important game of the season, uh, I can't accept that. And uh, I would prefer would have preferred to, to win against Salzburg in Moscow rather than having two useless draws against Atletico. And then against Atletico, we had a good game, two good games. Uh, but again, we parked the bus and we played on counters and uh, hoping that someone over there, uh, which was Zeluish in that case, uh, scored that goal. And uh, we know perfectly that Atletico in uh, in the offense, offensive line uh, 
there's a lot of problems. So if you play, true. if you play very very compact and you don't give them space, uh, I mean, they are not known for being a. a mm -hmm. Yeah. That that is true. And Artem, here's a question I want to ask you, right? Uh, but, that's right, Stefano. I, I agree with you there. I mean, you know, we talk about like results in Russian football, so like really impressive results. Um, so Dynamo wins, losing eight nil, and then it beating Dortmund, and you know, CSK beating someone, Real Madrid, of course. Yeah, that. So if you look at Atletico, there they have been, they have conceded two goals in ten games in, in La Liga this season, right? So Artem, where do you think? those locomotive draws against Atletico, where do you think they rank in like the all-time Russian football results table in Europe? Like top 20, top 30, top 50, top 10? Can I be really annoying? Sure. My, co my computer just did not let me hear anything what you just said. <laughs> right, so what I, what, I, what I said was, you, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. All right, fix your computer, man. Why I you know. Doing? Fix your computer. Uh, but look, I mean, look, Atletico have conceded two goals in 10 games this season in the Liga, right? Okay. And Lokomotiv basically have scored, they scored one against uh, Atletico, right? Which is big, given yeah. how good they are, clearly. So where does, you know, we talk about like results. So um, CSK beating Real Madrid is probably like the best result in Russian football history. Uh, Dinamo means closing 8-1 to Zenit is up there. Where do you think these draws that Loco got against Atletico, where do you think they rank? Are they the top 15, top 20, top 10, top 50? Where? All time. I mean, I'd, I'd struggle to think of 50 games. Like, I'd, 50 good games in Europe from Russian clubs. <laughs> like, I'd struggle to think of 20 off the top of my head. Um, uh, like, they're good results, but because they're not wins, they don't have that same feeling, you know what I mean? Like, of course yeah. they're good results, but like, like, the, it's not as good as, like, like you mentioned there, CSK beating Real Madrid. Like, yeah, that was great. But that wasn't as good as Rostov beating Bayern. That wasn't as good as Ruben beating Barcelona. Definitely not. Even actually, even though CSK no. won both both games against Real, even though how impressive that is, I think that those other games were more impressive. Oh, yeah, for sure. That was the worst Real Madrid in history. The one that we loved. That was a painful time for me in life, man. Like, we were terrible during that time. We uh, never been as bad, and I think we've never I mean, been course, as bad as he says yesterday. Only having the chance to get knocked out of the Champions League, come fourth in the group. <laughs> no, we still did it, didn't we? And we were worse that season for sure. Under Lopetegui and Solari, we went five games without scoring. I don't think we we had never gone five games without scoring like in our entire history. We were terrible that season. Hanu, uh, but, Hanu, 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 you, you, you've got to remember, though, in situations like this, it could be worse. You could be Antonio Conte, who always bottles that's in That's mad, Europe, honestly. That, Inter, that is, they're just shocking. They're just the biggest choke artists on the planet Inter, Earth. Shakhtar, as well, beat Real Madrid twice, finished third. That's why you should not beat Real Madrid twice. Let us win every game. Do your <laughs> thing. Like, just chill out. And you know what? Even French football, uh, Richard, you know about French football. Uh, French teams, by the way, Artem and Stefano, they lost 13 out of the 18 games they played in the Champions League. Russia lost 12 or 11, I think. So Russian football is objectively better than French football. Respect. We, have, we are there. We have done it. They've caught French football. They've caught, French football. They've caught it up. They've caught French football up. But <laughs> Yeah, but everybody else is like just, just running away. Everybody else is catching up. Can we just uh, mention quickly, CSK are now losing. Yeah, exactly. And... Um, the score is Pep Guardiola. It's <laughs> it's literally some bloke called J Guardiola. Guardiola. Yeah, almost Guardiola. Almost. Almost. Is he bald? That's the question. No, anyway. you see, you see, oh, Zenit's yeah, been, Zenit's been getting a lot of criticism for their performances in Europe recently, but I think a decent chunk of that has to go on CSK, Cisca as that's well. True. Yeah, they true. were top seeded, you know. Okay, Zenit were top seeded, but they're in a group with Dortmund. They're in a group with Lazio. They're two good sides, but you know, Wolfsberger and Dinamo Zagreb. Who Dinamo Moscow paid what was it eight million for Nikola Moro, like the best midfielder, and yet yeah. it's unbelievable. I, I, I think Goncharenko is under pressure too as well. I don't think it should just be <laughs> shut solely. Um, Samak that's coming under fire. Goncharenko, you know, he needs to. 
I do, I do for sure think CSK have gotten away with, um, you know, not getting as much um, abuse as the other Criticism. folks. Yeah, that, I don't know but, why. I think that's why is that though? I, I, do you know what? Maybe it's just because it's the Europa League, and it's like you know, people aren't watching as much because like they don't have any big teams in their group. I guess that should make it worse, really. That but I think everyone's just kind of like a like they did quite well in the league during the same time, though. So I think that maybe. For that reason, people are like, oh, clearly they're focusing on that or something. I don't know. They should have gotten more flack for it, to be honest. Yeah, they yes. should have. They should have qualified. And I think last year was they got more flack because they got thumped. They got like five nil beaten by Ludo Goretz. They <sighs> lost to Espanyol, who got relegated that season. Who were awful uh, in La Liga. <laughs> awful in La Liga. The, the, the who was the, like... who was the worst team in uh, in the Europa League for you this season? Cesca, Dinamo, or Rostov? It's a hard uh, fight. <laughs> that is hard, Dinamo. Dinamo for sure. Yeah, probably Dinamo. Yeah. Dinamo for sure. Although, Rostov, although, Rostov although, mad at. although it would have been interesting if Sandro Schwartz had been in at Dinamo from the start, I don't think they'd have lost that game against um, yeah. Lokomotiv Tbilisi. I, I, I think I, Novikov was a very poor manager. Honestly, I feel like no one should lose. To, I think we could like make an RFN 11 and probably... No disrespect to Lokomotiv Tbilisi, of course, but I feel like... No disrespect to Lokomotiv Tbilisi, but, but some people some who, who have never played yeah. together and are not here, professional here. football players <laughs> could beat them. Dinamo, Dinamo played that game like they had never played together. Now, let's be honest, right? They, they were terrible in that game. Uh, but yeah. You know what, though? You know what, though? In a couple of years' time, if there's some kind of tournament in Russia, obviously the Euros are happening this year, but I don't think we're going to be able to organise it in that time. We need to make an RFN 5 side team. And just enter one of the. We can make two, two RFN yeah. five side teams and just we can make RFN eleven SR teams. Honestly, it's cool, but I just you're not going to get eleven people meeting up in the same place. Richard, what what uh, are you a goalkeeper? Are you a defender? What what's your preferred position on the football pitch? Preferred position's goalkeeper, sir. All right, so we have a goalkeeper. That's big because usually you you don't find a goalkeeper. You just have to like. Toss a coin or something, or just pay a line to play. <laughs> Stefano, what's your? Uh, where do you play? Winger. Winger. Artem's Artem's a winger as well, I think. Uh well, I've, I've played. I've played everywhere in my time, you know, in my long football career. Um, <laughs> but that that that's interesting, Stefano, because I, I, like, I, is it a thing in Italy where like everyone wants to be a defender? No, oh. totally, not at all. <laughs> oh, no one. How the hell is the best defender? Then? Because we have a defensive culture. I mean, even when you are young and yet coaches teaches you more how to defend rather than how to offense. It's like that, probably. That's interesting. That's interesting for us. Well, literally just, not everybody's playing attack. We don't have any defense today, sorry. I was trying to think where I would want to play, but honestly, it's just been so long since I like played a football game that I would just play anywhere. I'd be happy to you know be Hannah, I expected you to come out with some like crazy FM position, like Ram Deuter no, or something. Um, honestly, it's like you know, you know, somehow like sometimes like dogs and cats just find their way onto the football pitch and just happy, really happy. Yeah, like that's how I'd feel because in India it's impossible to play. Like there's no grounds unless you're playing, paying a lot of money. There's like you can't go to like a, a proper academy or something. It's not like there's mad five side pitches just sprinkled across the city. Mm. And, and I, I wonder, I wonder why India are never doing well in international football. India, don't get me. This is a four-hour podcast. If I get started about Indian football, but uh, let's, we'll get Sarthak on and talk about that one day as well. Okay, actually, we need to ask both our guests today. We've been asking. This is a, st- a stupidly strange question, but we've been asking <laughs> it for the last three weeks in a row. So, when do you think the first Indian is going to play in the RPL? How are they going to know that? I don't know that, and I still took a guess. Um, oh, it's difficult because I, I think we, me and Hannah, we were having this debate on uh, we we on a on the RFN chat, weren't we? We were saying that how there's two different leagues in India, isn't there? There's the um, yeah, there's, there's the I League and the Indian Super League, isn't there? Yes. So, so difficult question to answer. It's it's you know. The level is lower, you know. Obviously, to to play in a league like the Premier League or or Serie A or La Liga, you'd have to be of a really high level. Um, the level in Russia is is lower, so maybe it might happen. It might happen, you know, more sooner than what 
what you know my one might think initially. But do you think in the next question. ten years? That's that's pretty much what the question I'm asking. The next ten years or no? Because I think Hanu said no, and I said no. I in the next ten years. Yeah, I said the next ten years, and Hanu said no, no way. Maybe stretch it to fifteen, fifteen, maybe. I think yeah, it's a fair show. What about you, you know Stefano? What? what do you think? Yeah, what about you, Stefano? But I think that probably if some Indian players are going to play in Russia, they have to start in the FNL, and then they have to prove. Hey, you know what? You know what? That's that's true. And yes. One thing is, I feel like I'm sure India has players that can play for like Tambo or that can play for a, a decent FNL team. But I just feel like it's not going to happen because no, like very little. Like you can count Indian players that have played abroad on one hand. So. <laughs> I, you really can. I'm not joking. So un- unless you like get a guy who was born in India, I mean, sorry, born in Russia, but he's half Indian. That's the only way I can see it happening. Mm-hmm. And if that happens, honestly, he's going to be my best friend. If so. if 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 you want that a player straight away from India goes to Russia, you have to write to Twitter to sell you. Then of course, yeah, so, yeah. we I, I need to. We actually to sell you we, we had we had Saratak on the on the podcast last week, right? And he he um he is what. He knows one of the, 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 the... What? He's Indian. I, I know he's Indian. That's <laughs> not what I was saying. <laughs> what I was saying is he knows someone who has a football academy in India. And we, we uh, were kind of joking, half joking, half not joking at all. Um, that he, he should start get, like ask that guy to, to bring a few players over for trial in Russia. And that way Saratak can get, a, can get the agent's fee or whatnot. It could happen, honestly. I feel like it's just going to be... It only takes one guy. It only takes one guy. That's the thing, exactly. It only takes one guy. And I hope that one guy happens soon. And I do hope Indian football improves. Um, Honestly, you never know. It could be like... We could be thinking like, oh yeah, an Indian's going to play in the RPL. But like, you could get in two years' time that just some random Indian lady is playing in the... uh, That's... You know what you... In the women's league. You've stolen it out of my head. I think that's going to happen. (laughs) <laughs> that's gonna happen first. That is without a doubt, no disrespect at all. I'm dead serious. That would be great to see as well, because the Russian, because like we already have like a, a female footballer who's playing for Rangers, and she scored a goal as well on the weekend, and that's a pretty high level, you know, playing in Scotland, and like Russian football, the Russian women's league, the Superliga is also like. I I would feel like it's more liberal in buying players from India and so on, they would be more open-minded as to say RPL where there's the foreigner limit and mad agents and stuff. So I think that's going to... Is that there might no happen. foreigner limit in women's football in Russia? I There might be, but I just feel Because like, if they're not, that's just so contradictory and the most stupid thing I've ever heard. There probably is, but I just feel like they would be more open-minded in buying an Indian player than... Uh, and India, I think India has some pretty good female footballers as well, like India has more good female footballers than male footballers. That's uh, that's my opinion, but I might be wrong as well. Uh, moving on, Artem, this is the third week in a row we have left Krasnodar for a good hour. <laughs> we are 58 minutes in and haven't even touched on, on Krasnodar. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, Krasnodar drew 1-1 to Chelsea. No one really cared about this game either just because of, of the time it was it was happening and there were other games going on, other things going on. But, Richard, what do you think about this result? And um, what do you think about Krasnodar's campaign as a whole? I think both Krasnodar and Lokomotiv have probably been the two sides who, throughout this whole Champions League and Europa League campaign, can probably hold their heads up high the most. Um, they've both overperformed I think based on our preseason expectations um, there is with Krasnodar though Hanu what I will say is, is that we've been discussing this on the RFM pod uh, Krasu, um, uh, with Hanu and Archer and we've been discussing on the on the RFM pod there's probably happiness that Krasnodar have managed to get European football after Christmas um, in the shape of um, a Europa League spot but also perhaps a, a tinge of um, you know regret as well because you know in the last two games against uh, both Chelsea away and against Wren at home, they've acquitted themselves very, very well. And that's because we think primarily because they had the full assortment of players available. You know, they had in the first four games, it was, you know, it was chaotic. They had players that were injured, players infected with COVID. 
that kind of thing. Um, and I think that really stopped them from getting their first team out. And, you know, that might have played a part in one or two of their results. But, you know, when they had all their players fit against Wren last, last week, they performed really well and got a got a well-earned victory. I think they deserved that, that victory as well. And against Chelsea, you know, people said it was a reserve Chelsea side, but by the end, they had, they had more than a decent chunk of first-team players on. You know, they had um, Werner on, came on as a sub. I think Havertz came on as a sub. They had Kovacic in midfield, Tammy Abraham up front. They even had, you know, Kepa's been criticised from left, left, right and centre by Chelsea fans, but he's still a £70 million goalkeeper. You know, he still probably costs more than the entire Krasnodar first team. So they had some first-team players on their Chelsea. So I think this is a really good result for Krasnodar, um, you know. Um, and the game against Wren too, and you know, it's, what, it's, it's that it's that magical um, two-word phrase, isn't it? What if you know if they'd have had their full-strength side available to take to Wren with them? I think they could have competed with Wren uh, very, very strongly. You know, Wren's both Wren's goals this season in Champions League came from penalties. I think both both them and Marseille, their only goals this season in the Champions League came from penalties. So you know, below PSG and you know Lyon last season, the level of French foot clubs this season in Europe not great. So I think they they could have won that game in France. So they had the full strength side available. Then maybe even one of the games against Sevilla. So no, I, I've got to take my hat off to Krasnodar. Um, they they've been very very good. Uh, I'm delighted that they've managed to get through. Not bad at all for a debut campaign. And um, yeah, but again that frustrating feeling of what if if they could have won one of the games against Sevilla, maybe beat Ren, took it to the last day. Who knows? But yeah, yeah they deserve praise. They deserve and, uh, praise for sure. I think. And by the way, CSK are now two goals down. <laughs> uh, or such scored a header. So, and I think uh, Krasnodar. I think we all said that they're just there for a good time, not a long time. They're just happy to be there. Um, so I think they've definitely done well. They overperformed or just performed to the expectation. And I think off the debutants, who were the debut? No, actually, Gladbach got up to the knockout. So that's not going to happen. I was going to say that out of all think, the debutants, uh, I don't not, think Gladbach are debutants. I think they've been in before. And I might be wrong there. Well, who Michelin are definitely and debutants. Ren are Ren debutants. Are, Ren are debutants. Debut, debutants. And so Frank Barros have not been in for like 26 years. 25 years, years exactly. Yeah. yeah. So Krasnodar did at least better than Ren and Michelin, who were the two other debutants. So, uh, Stefano, what did you think of Krasnodar and, and how far do you think they can go in the Europa League? I totally agree with Richard. And uh, I think that if it wasn't for Caio or. Uh, how they wasted the 2-0 advantage against Sevilla. They could also have tried to to go for the one out, one out of eight of the Champions League because uh, they were very good. I mean, they were very close. So I think that uh, we can wait for something interesting uh, next next year in the Europa League. I mean, I also hope that they are going to sign someone in the transfers window because, of course, they, they need reinforcement. Uh, and, for sure, and also it depends by the draw. I mean, if they are lucky or not lucky, because uh, if they drew something, someone who is very very strong, uh, I don't think that the Krasnodar is mentally ready for uh, to face them. Yeah, that's true. Artem, I, I want a quick prediction. Where, how far do you think Krasnodar are going? You know, uh, you know what? I'm gonna say they're gonna go on a could run i think they're like based on absolutely nothing i'm gonna guess that they're uh they're gonna get some nice draws and they'll get to the quarterfinal i hope so i honestly i would be happy if they just get past one knockout round that's yeah, me the, too. that's I'm, I'm hoping for just that because of how dead this season has been but if that happens i'll be very happy of course that's just big for coefficients big for everything so that would be sick um Moving on, another topic we have for today. This is, uh, we've got a couple, but Shamil Gazizov has left Spartak. Um, this this was being touted for a while for the past two weeks. Um, and there were some allegations came out about Gazizov that, first of all, he tried to sabotage a transfer by sending in a decoy bid from UFA. Then allegations came out saying that he didn't like Tedesco, didn't want Tedesco, and that he wanted um, a local manager. He didn't want to work with Tedesco. And Artem, what do you think of Garizov being fired? Do you care? And uh, if the allegations are true, do you think he was rightly fired? 
I mean, you know, like the last couple of weeks I've been saying I'm going to keep taking out a pinch of salt until it's confirmed. Now it's and confirmed. It yeah. With, um, the Simpsons, uh, with the Simpsons gift, by the way. Yeah, that, I thought that was a bit disrespectful. I thought like a really, really weird thing to be posting from the official account. Um, but uh, it's, it, you know, it, it's strange. Like I, I thought he was doing a good job, but obviously like these rumors are coming out now and, you know, you, you, you kind of want everybody working together. In the backroom staff, you you don't want people coming out and like doing their own thing or like backhanding people behind their back and stuff like that. So maybe it's the right decision. I just don't know. I'd be interested to see who actually comes in. Um, I would be interested. Uh, but, but to be fair, they bring back Sorn. Coming. Bring back Sorn. That's not going to happen though. But we know who has come in. Uh, they made their security head their CEO. So he's going to be taking charge of like back office matters, so, like finance, infrastructure, all of that. And the pop-off guy is going to be the chief scout and the director of football. Um, Richard, what do you think of this uh, this sacking of Casido? We've just been discussing this on the RFM pod, actually. Um, you know, it's um, it's funny, isn't it? Because last week on the RFM pod, we were all saying, oh, here we go. This is Leonid Fadoon again. This is all this interference behind the scenes. This is, you know not letting Gazizov get on with his job and you know we were we were really unhappy about it but you know I kind of agree with you um what we were also we you, obviously you were on our chat Hannah and we were we were all discussing it when it when the news broke and I was sort of in agreement with you um I think Gazizov if, if if this is true of course it is only rumor we don't know the exact facts this this did came this did come from Spartak um telegrams um but if if, if this is true then I think Fadoon had to back a horse. He had to back either Gazizov or Tedesco. They're the two horses, and I think he's backed the right horse. I think he Tedesco is more of an asset to Spartak than Gazizov. You know, Tedesco got Schalke when he was just 33 years of age to finish second place in the Bundesliga, the highest finish in years. And okay, in the next season didn't go very well for them. But look at where Schalke are now. They're bottom of the Bundesliga. They're in a complete mess. You know, all his replacements have done even worse than he he did in his second season there. And he's now rebuilding his reputation really, really well in you know at Spartak. And I'm absolutely convinced if he can have a couple more good years at Spartak after this, maybe win them a title, have a good run in Europe, he'll get a good quality German job. You know, aside competing for the Europa League or possibly Champions League, I'm convinced he will get back to a decent level in Germany. And yeah, he's much more of an asset than Gazizov. And if these rumours are true about Gazizov, then I think it probably was best for Fadoon to cut um, to cut the relationship short. You know, because you don't want stuff like this, like disputes and disagreements between Tedesco and Gazizov building in the background. Um, and it's it's naive from Gazizov. I mean, if this is true about him wanting a foreign manager over Tedesco and wanting loads and loads of control, uh, you know that that's the rumour flying round anyway. The, the rumours flying round, but you know. When you're a club like Ufa, you are going to get that control. It's like, let's let's use the league as an example. If you're at someone like Getafe, you're going to get a large amount of control if you're a good sporting director because they're, a, they're a, a modest club with low expectations. But, you know, if you go to Real Madrid, you're going to have to probably accept that working for Florentino Perez comes with some, you know, some things you have to do. And it's somewhere the same, you know, it, it, it's, it's the same in every big club. If you go to a similar club in, in Italy, in England, there's, you're not going to have the same amount of autonomy. You're probably going to have to, it, you know, it, it's more of a, it's, it's a bigger club. It's, it's um, you know, more influence, more more politics behind the scenes. There's, there's all sorts of things. And I think Gazizov has been a bit naive if he really thought he could demand a large degree of control at Spartak because that's just not going to happen. And, you know, and wanting just, you know, the reports about wanting a Russian manager. I mean, look how badly the, some of the sides with Russian managers have been performing in this season's Champions League. It's been awful. You know, you've got to give a young, promising coach like Tedesco, you've got to try to work with him. So I actually think on this occasion, you know, when it all first came out, we were all critical of Leonid Fadoon. And, but now that more of this has come out, you know, I think actually you now Fadoon has done the right thing by backing um, Tedesco and um, bringing the whole thing to a close and, and, and all of this about, you know, him reportedly being interested in going to Loco. I mean, it'd be interesting to think of your, your thoughts on this. Um, yeah, Stefano. Stefano. But, uh, but he's, he's, he's going to, he's going he's gonna, to, but he's going to get, he's going to basically have a similar issue because I'd imagine at Locomotive, you know, will he be allowed to control there? You know, I think he's, he's been a little bit naive here. Um, Gazizov, in my opinion. Yeah, Stefano coming to you. Uh, what do you think of Gazizov possibly joining Locomotive over uh, Kik Nadze, who I know you hate? Everyone hates. Um, <laughs> I don't know what do to think? say because it seems that Spartak and Lokomotiv are playing against each other to prove uh, 
who has the wrong management. So I don't know if if Kazizov can come to Lokomotiv together with Kiknadze, but if Kiknadze um, is sacked or uh, moves out the club, I think it it would be a great option because uh, he's a very clever specialist. And uh, personally, I don't think that. Uh, he was fired from Fedun because uh, he was trying to to sack the desk. Probably he said something wrong at the, at, the, at the wrong person. It works like that, I think, in the club and also especially with with Fedun. So probably he has made a comment or has taken a decision which was uh, very bad. But uh, it's okay to make mistakes, and Fedun uh, mm, didn't decide to to keep on the, the collaboration. And if he comes to Lokomotiv for me, it, it would be a great news. I think maybe Gazizov together with Evzeev, and uh, it would be a nice couple to to see, and maybe together with Siomin, because uh, Evzeev and Siomin have a good uh, relationship. I think uh, that this trio could uh, yeah. Could, could work uh, very well together. And Siomin not as a coach, but also as a consultant or as a sporting director together with uh, Rothenberg. I mean, there are plenty of uh, choices. If you have the right people who who knows uh, how to to run a football club. That is true. And I, I don't know, I, I, I do think that... Um, I do think that Gazizo will find a job. I hope he goes back to Ufa. And Semak goes back to Ufa and they just build a nice little their project. They get that back together. It'll be really fun. Uh, but can I, I just, can, oh, sorry, yeah, can I just come in and say just one last thing. I was uh, about Stef- with that Stefano. I, I think, yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I certainly think Fadoon has made plentiful mistakes in his time at Spartak before, you know. And um, again, this is only, you know, that's an understatement. Uh, this is only hearsay. But but yeah, I think it, it is interesting to see, obviously, you know, we'll have to wait and see about more of it coming out in the next few days, won't we? Because I'm I'm absolutely certain Gazizov will have, have his side of the story as well. Um, but I think, yeah, if, if you know, there's probably some, every word is probably bits you can take from the argument about who was right, who was wrong there, who was yeah. right here. But I think the most important thing for Spartak was it just needed sorting because when you're in a great position to win the league like they are, the last thing you want is all this going on in the background. So, but yeah, obviously I know full well that Fadoon has, you know, in the past, <laughs> you know, has, has certainly done, made really bad decisions for Spartak. And they so. could also, also have waited a couple of weeks to make the announcement. I mean, this season, just two weeks and it's it's finished. Yeah, there's, it could have been done during the winter there's, break. Yeah. There, there's no point to, to mean yeah. the, the atmosphere within the team because, of course, this has a huge impact. Yeah. That is true. I mean, it'll be interesting to see uh, where he does end up, where what happens with Spartak and Loco and, and all of them. Uh, our final topic for the day, because we are running uh, a bit later on time, um, Russia's qualification draw for uh, the the World Cup in 2022. This was a really fun draw because the first four teams have the same color scheme in their flags. And, you know, Croatia and Slovakia are close together. And then Russia. Slovenia is good for Stefano because it shares a border with Italy. So maybe he could check out that game if fans are allowed. <laughs> uh, but Artem, coming to you first, what do you think of this draw? And how do you think Russia will do? Games, by the way, start in March uh, 2021. So keep that in mind. It's not going to be an easy group, I don't think. Um, like I, I'd, I'd really like the Russian national team to take this time and you know find a new manager um, before this thing starts, but they're not going to do that. Um, I think that it's going to be tight, but I'm going to be positive because Russia in recent years have been quite good in qualifying. So I'm going to say that Russia are going to come second. Um, I don't know if Croatia are going to come first or if one of the other uh, one of the other Slavic boys are going to come first. But uh, I, don't, I don't think it's going to be Russia this time around. Um, Savannah, so what about you? Where do you think Russia will finish? What do you uh, think of the group? I think that Russia will be first without any without any doubt, and then Russia will try for the second and will fight together with Slovenia and Slovakia. But the level the level is uh, more or less the same because I don't think that in the next couple of in the next months, um, I mean the situation will change, and especially Cherchezov has a lot of pressure and it's an it's an hard situation. I think so. 
I don't expect anything good, if honest. It will be very, very balanced. Uh, Richard, what about you? What do you think of the group? Um, I agree with Stefano. I think Croatia will come top of the group. Um, but, you know, the other spot, I think Russia should finish second. I mean, I think Slovakia, some of the key players now, they've still got some good players, but I think some of them are getting a bit older now, like Hamsik. You know, he's been a very good player, but, you know, probably starting to get on a little bit now. Um, I know they've got the, the brilliant defender at Inter Milan, is it? Milan Skriniar, I think. Yeah. Yeah, he's a good player at Inter Milan. Um, I don't know much about Slovenia, uh, outfield player-wise. I know they've still got um, Jan Oblak in goal. Uh, just watch him have an absolute brilliant game against Russia now on both games because <laughs> he's just absolutely um, superb for Atletico. Um, I'd say Russia are probably favourites for that second spot behind Croatia. I think Croatia are going to win the group, so they should get into the playoffs for the, for the World Cup. But... It does depend on Churchisov evolving the team. Like we was when we watched those um, those games against Turkey and um, Serbia recently, it was just so frustrating to still keep seeing him play the likes of Zhirkov, still keep you know persisting with these older players. You know Zabalotny, you know players who are not good, really good enough. You know you've got to evolve a side. I think he's not done that enough since the World Cup. So it'd be very interesting to see. Be interesting to see if some of the criticism that, and it was really vociferous criticism that he received. It'd be interesting to see if that you know um, spurs him on to now finally start to evolve this team because the Euros are not too far away, and you know you're not getting any um, you're not getting any easy time in international football breaks coming up. You know you're straight into World Cup qualifying because mm-hmm. of the obviously the COVID thing put it back, and then you're and then you're straight into the Euros and then back into the World Cup qualifying again. So I think Russia should finish second in that draw, but um, they're going to have to evolve the side because you know if they carry on playing like they did against Serbia with the same personnel, then they're not going to qualify. So, so I'm going to back Russia to come second, but with the caveat of you know start evolving the team. That's that's my message to Churchisov, and I think it's a message we all hear on this pod and many others share. So, yeah, that's fair. And um, yes, sir, I think Russia will come second. I think they'll manage it. I think. Uh... Croatia will, will come first, and I think Slovakia and Slovenia, like uh, you guys said, will fight it out for the third spot. Uh, but I think that brings us to the end of this episode. Um, we had fun. We had fun, of course. It was it was great uh, having you guys on, Richard and Stefano. Artem, pleasure as always, obviously. Um, uh, Richard, would you like to plug anything before we go? Maybe your Twitter account, maybe something you've written or uh, so on. Yeah, um, I'm on Twitter. I'm on at RichDPike89, at RichDPike89. I'm a writer for Heart of Football website. And um, if you're interested in playing Football Manager, you should definitely check out uh, the next couple of weeks on that site. There will be some absolutely, there will be 50 sides you should be on Football Manager, split into five uh, pieces of 10 um, teams. And there will be some um, RPL and FNEL clubs on there. I won't give away which ones, but there's four of them. And um, you should check those games out if you're um, interested in taking on a challenge in Russia. I also write for Outside of the Boot too, and there'll be some work on that site going forward. And obviously some work for RFN as well going forward. So, yeah, that's what I want to promote. Um, of course, yeah, check out Richard's work. And of course, RFN as well. We've got a couple of really, really big interviews coming up. Uh, some good content over there. So keep an eye out for that as well. Uh, Stefano, would you like to promote anything? Maybe your Twitter or your uh, Telegram or something else? I would like to thank you for this invitation because it was very interesting to talk together. And yes, for my definitely, you already linked it before as well as the Telegram one, and it's it's very cool. So see you there, and uh, thanks again. See you for the next uh, podcast. Of course, it was great having you on. And uh, Artem, if you'd like to do the honors. Yeah, guys, like Hanu said, pleasure to have you both on. And, and listeners, whoever made it to the end, respect, as always. Thank you so much for listening. Leave a gold medal on SportRex, a like on YouTube. Any comments on Twitter or YouTube or anywhere else are always appreciated. We love talking to you guys. And uh, we'll see you again next week.